It's an honor and a privilege to, for me to introduce to you our speaker. He's a personal friend that I've known for more than 40 years. I've heard him speak in a few countries of the world where I happen to be going with him. But he just finished talking in the Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia for three and two thirds months. And he had, I asked him how many lectures. He says, he didn't count for so many. Probably averaged one a day. He's a very young man. He's only 98. He's indefatigable. He's got lots of energy. And he's an adjunct professor of nutrition at the School of Public Health in Loma Linda University, where my wife and I had the privilege of earning our Master's of Public Health and Nutrition. And uh, he's taught me many, many things, and he's still teaching me. So it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce to you one of my very closest and special friends. God is my best, but you know, John's, John is a very good man. He's going to share with you, give you an update on nutrition, lifestyle medicine. And it's, you only have one body. You do have two eyes, two ears, and two nares. But you better learn how to take care of it. And uh, you need to start to learn to live now like you're going to live in heaven. Okay. So your health is your responsibility. John, the time is yours. I want to talk about Jesus and cardiovascular disease. I'm not sure I need this. <laughs> you can't hear me, let me know. Can you hear him? Or you want Can you hear me back there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. I've never used one of those for years. <laughs> now, cardiovascular disease is killing more people in the industrialized countries than the next five leading causes of death combined. You got that? It's a big deal. They have just discovered since 2010, and nobody's heard about it, that it can be controlled with lifestyle better than any medicine. Yeah. Sister White said when I was a medical student, way back then, she said, you know, the Lord planned a doctor to teach people how to live so they didn't need medicine. We were to reform the practice of the doctors of the world. I couldn't understand how that could be. Now I understand it. The World Health Organization, the American Heart Association, the European Cardiology Society, all agree that lifestyle works better than any medicine or medical procedure. Even the Bible has the word lifestyle now. The new International Scripture Version Psalms 119, 59 says, I have reviewed my ways, my lifestyle, and I'm turning my feet in your direction. <laughs> lifestyle is a big deal. It's not a small deal, particularly when you can get by without any doctors or any medicine. There's seven risk factors you must avoid. Number one. Cigarette smoking. Number two, alcohol. The biggest study on alcohol ever done was just completed. Dr. Max Griswold, the University of Seattle, did it. 195 countries he studied. And behind him is where Bill Gates lives. Heard of Bill Gates? He funded the study. And he had only one question. How much is safe to drink? He found the answer. It was zero. <laughs> Up to now, they said one drink a day for women, two for men, maybe okay, maybe safe. No longer. It's zero. <coughs> so that's the latest information I'll talk. The third risk factor, exercise. Exercise. Inactivity is a bad thing. We got exercise. Fourth risk factor is overweight. 
I had a lady help me with my PowerPoint graphics. She was good at this. She learned her living doing this for advertising companies. She was kind of big. I mean, big, 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 big. <laughs> I said, Kathy, I must talk to you about your weight. I'm a preventive medicine doctor. You want the good news first or the bad news? <coughs> she said, give me the bad news first. Okay, the bad news is, Kathy, anybody your size should know that the death rate increases for almost any disease we know. But now the good news. If you will exercise every day, even though you're big, you will live longer than the person who's a normal weight who doesn't exercise. Got that? <coughs> if you're a man who smokes, has high blood cholesterol, has high blood cholesterol, uh, has high blood pressure, but he exercises every day, he will live longer than the man who doesn't have any of those who doesn't exercise. And I should add to what Claire said last week exercise in middle age for the for the people with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, is what works the best, exercise in middle age. When I was 51, I gave up my teaching job at Loma Linda, moved to the country, close to Yosemite. I bought 28 acres of land, all forced. Back to the National Forest. I cleared the land with my Husqvarna chainsaw. <laughs> planted 80 fruit trees. Oh, One year I planted 3,000 strawberry plants. People said, what do you do with all those strawberries? They don't understand. Everybody likes strawberries. It's the best way to make friends there is. <laughs> I built my house back there, you know. Changed all quarter of a mile to get to the highway. Uh, I exercised middle age. I was 51 when I started. At 80 years of age, I decided I needed a wood splitter. <laughs> <laughs> but I exercised tremendously. Exercise is extremely important. Okay. Now, the fifth risk factor. We said alcohol, tobacco, alcohol, inactivity, fourth one was overweight, fifth one got them into real trouble. They said too much meat. Americans like meat. If everybody ate as much meat as we eat, you don't have enough food to go around for 20% of the population. <laughs> Nobody liked that idea of meat. So they had to change it. The Heart Association changed it. And they said, eat more fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. But they mean less, less meat. Mm -hmm. Then they added two other risk factors. High blood pressure and high blood cholesterol. But if you do the first five, you aren't apt to have high blood pressure high cholesterol. First five, negate all that other stuff, okay? What are they going to do about the meat problem? They got a new thing in there. They said, don't eat more than 5 to 6% of your calories from saturated fat. You got that? What's saturated fat? You know what that is? Yeah. That's a nice way of seeing, saying, be a vegetarian. <laughs> Without saying the word. Now, if some of you don't know, I have a little card on this is a chart of fatty acids. The red represents the saturated fat. That's the bottom line. The red. Now, what has the most saturated fat in it? The longest red line. Coconut. 
Why is our coconut always health food? Not really. And the coconut oil is the one that I use the most. Coconut has more heart attack. Okay. It's true, it's used medically for kids with epileptic attacks. They use a ketogenic diet, which means coconut. Oil. Okay. So coconut oil is not so bad. But we don't grow coconut, so I'm not worried about you taking coconut. <laughs> but the next one, the next one up, what is that? Butter. 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 The Heart Association has for years said don't use butter. That's what Ellen White told us. They use it. Don't use butter. Okay? Butter. So if you drink milk, should not be more than 1% fat. That's what the recommendation is in heart. I had a man, he wasn't overweight much. He wasn't uh, eating a lot of meat. He had terribly high cholesterol and triglycerides. It took me a long time to find that right question. I finally found it. Do you like ice cream? <laughs> yes, I like ice cream. So occasionally, for dessert, you'll have a bowl of ice cream. Well, it isn't quite like that. Well, how is it? I eat my ice cream before I go to sleep at night. <laughs> One bowl is not big enough. I go out to the kitchen and get a mixing bowl. <laughs> and I'd mash it together so my wife would not know how many scoops it was. <laughs> And then I would put the strawberries, you know the sliced strawberries with added sugar? It was sweet enough, so I whipped sugar into it. And then I put whipped cream on top. It was sweet, you know, all know whipped cream is sweet. So I whipped sugar into it, put it on top. I said, how long have you been doing this? Oh, every night for the last six months. No wonder your cholesterol and triglycerides are high. It took me a long time to get him down. But you know what he said to me? Don't you Agnes have a place where we can go and learn how to eat right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's what we need. That's exactly what we need. Okay? Well, his blood pressure, his uh, blood cholesterol and triglycerides finally came down. Now, when you're talking about milk fat, you're talking about cheese. You're talking about pizza. <laughs> You've got to start ordering non-cheese pizzas. <laughs> they make them now. <laughs> okay? Yeah, they do. Pizza. Ice cream. Pizza. Now, there's something that's not on the chart that's left off. That's high in saturated fat. You should know about it. It's chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Oh, the Hershey Chocolate Bar Company says, it's not high in saturated fat per serving. If you have a chocolate bar, one seventh of the chocolate bar is one serving. So if you take a whole week to eat it, it's not too hot. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? Who buys a chocolate bar and waits a whole week to get it eaten? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so chocolate is terribly high in saturated fat. Then what's above that one? Palm oil. You don't grow that over here. You grow it in Malaysia. But they ship it here. They ship it here. You will go to the grocery store. You'll look at the labels. You'll find it. What's above that? Lard. Pig fat. And you might as well add beef fat to it also. Pig fat and beef fat. They're high in saturated fat. So when we're talking about saturated fat, we're talking about meat fats, dairy fats, and chocolate. <laughs> okay. So when we say five to six percent of your calories should be from saturated fat, that means vegetarian diet. Without using any bad words like vegetarian. <laughs> or meat. No bad words are being used. Just saturated fat. Okay, so you got that. 
Now, this is dietism. I can go into public schools and teach the Adventist health message scientifically. Tobacco, alcohol, inactivity, overweight, too much meat, eat more fruits and vegetables. Then don't worry about the reading the blood pressure, blood pressure, okay? I can teach this to public school students. World Health Organization says this is right. You can lower your heart attack risk 80% with avoiding these risk factors. You can lower your risk of stroke 80%. You can lower your risk of type 2 diabetes 88%. That's good. Amen. Better than any medicine could do. Even when they thought statins were good, they said only helps 30%. Now, a little bit about the cholesterol story. Your total cholesterol in the blood is made up of what? HDL cholesterol. That's supposed to be the good one. If it's low, you exercise, it's supposed to go up. Now they discovered it has nothing to do with heart disease. <laughs> Chinese Canadian doctor did a study of 600,000 Canadians, just kind of proved that. This one then against Dr. Bill Castelli's view, fourth director of the premium study. He and I used to lecture together. My HDL was low. I called him up on the phone. What should I do? Are you still a vegetarian? I said, yes. He said, stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we don't think this means too much on the heart disease thing. But the bad one for the men is LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein cholesterol. That's the men's risk factor, not the women. Then there's another one, very low density, lipoprotein cholesterol. Now we used to measure this, these things, we don't anymore. We know how much this is by taking the blood triglycerides, divide by five, and that tells you how much cholesterol there is in here. The main risk factor for women in heart attacks is triglycerides. Okay? That's a fatty acid, three carbons of carbon in a row. So the fatty acid in three spots is tri triglycerides. Now, this is important for men too. If this is at the top of normal, 1.7 millimoles, or a Let's say 150. If it's at no one, uh, 150. If it's at this milligram level, it's normal. Doctor hasn't told you so. He just says you're right. Don't worry. I'll take care. of it. You say I want to know the number because the number is meaningful. If it's high, normal. That means 90% of the LDL particles are the small, dense type, which increases the risk of heart attack sevenfold. If it's low, if it's a six, uh, if it's down here, 60 to 80 milligrams, then I have to keep going back and forth between the millimoles and milligrams in Europe. Then 90% is of the large, light, buoyant kind, which has only twice the risk of a heart attack. I'm having all my school kids go home and get their parents' numbers out. Look. <laughs> they should look out two things. Triglycerides, LDL cholesterol. This tells us 
what size those are. And we used to measure them, we don't anymore. We know by the triglycerides what it is, okay? So it's the LDL cholesterol and the triglycerides we need to look at. Now, statin drugs. 24 million Americans are taking statin pills to lower their blood cholesterol. They've done extensive studies on them. Here's what we've discovered. For 93% of the people who take the pills, it doesn't help them to live any longer at all. It doesn't do any good any which way. You got that? 93% of the people are wasting their money on taking the little pill. With 7% of them who already have heart disease, they live an eight and a third year longer, something like that. So that's worthwhile. But medically, we have a problem. We don't know who has heart disease and who doesn't. We're guessing, and we're guessing by cholesterol level, which is a poor guess doesn't really tell us, okay? We need to find out a better method who has heart disease and who doesn't. Oh, there's expensive tests. It costs $980 to go to San Francisco and get it done. My insurance company won't pay for it. Overseas, the socialistic countries, they won't pay for it. So nobody's gonna pay for that. So that's one of our problems. The other problem is, the doctors haven't had any course in nutrition worth anything. You ask your doctor, what should I eat for breakfast tomorrow morning? He doesn't want to act stupid. <laughs> he has to give you an answer. So he says, what did my wife feed me for breakfast? <laughs> he doesn't have anything nutritionally to go by. We need a good course in nutrition for doctors. Amen. They're treating people without knowing nutrition. Amen. And we need to know how do you tell who has heart disease and who doesn't. We don't know. We need a method. Short, easy method to find out. So for 93% of the people, it's not doing a bit of good. So I saw a Canadian Adventist doctor working in San Francisco, putting people on all these medications. Are you, I said, are you treating the women just like the men? Oh yes, of course. They don't know there's a difference. I'm a doctor and I know there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know there was a difference between the men and women. <laughs> Did you know most all the studies on cholesterol were done on men? And they said women are just like men, so we treat them the same way. <laughs> Ridiculous. So they did three studies on women. One study, it improved their situation 1%. The other one, it decreased their situation 16%. Another one decreased their chance of dying, 50, increased it by 57%. Increased their chance of dying, 57%. I don't think women should be taking those pills, period. The World Cardiology Journal, 2015. Said what well, we should tell our patients about statins. <clears throat> you should tell them that we used to think if we lowered everybody's cholesterol, there would be no more heart disease. Mm -hmm. We were wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So what should we tell them? We should tell them what will really benefit them. What is that? Lifestyle. Lower the risk 80% with lifestyle. But our problem is, we have maybe 25 dollars work, uh, 25 doctors working in a group together here. One of the guys in charge, he says, now fellas, you gotta see another patient every 10 minutes, or we aren't gonna be able to make a living on this. We aren't gonna get any money out of this. In 10 minutes, They've had hard enough, had harder time to ask you anything. Let them find out what you really need to do. And then another problem is, he writes a prescription. You will now exercise one hour every week. 
every day, every day, one hour meal. And this overweight lady comes back in a month, a little bit better. <laughs> and the doctor says, now, did you exercise this time? No. After he's heard that a hundred times, he stopped telling him to exercise. We haven't learned yet how to tell people how to, to do what they should do, to get them to do it. That's the next big breakthrough in healthcare. But we have the breakthrough in discovering the germ theory, Pasteur and his study, flash studies. We had the breakthrough on penis, penicillin with Fleming. And now in 2020, we had a breakthrough. Lifestyle does better than any medicine. <laughs> Tremendously. It's exactly what Sister White told us. It's what we were supposed to be telling the world. And we didn't do it. And here we were given all these principles in the writings of Ellen C. White. And we didn't accept it. God was so kind to it. He gave the principles to the worldly doctors, and they came back, hey, Phyllis, what she told you was right. <laughs> <laughs> what she told you was right. <laughs> so it's exciting about the standard pills, how they aren't doing much good for many people, because we don't really know who has heart disease, who might benefit from it. And so we're wasting a lot of money. Any question anybody has so far? <laughs> yes, back here. I was told that the statin medication for females, once on it long term, you're going to become diabetic. It increases risk of diabetes, that's true. It increases risk of diabetes, that's true. Uh, I don't think women should be on that, that medicine at all. Okay. Yes. Well, aren't statin drugs in general, aren't they not good for you because of all the adverse reactions that are related? No, I didn't get it. <laughs> Talk a little bit louder. I said the statin drugs, in general, they are not good for you at all because of the side effects, uh, muscle atrophy. Their side effects, that. that's true. Their side effects, uh, but <laughs> the, in, in about 19... I don't remember the date exactly, but they did say that men 75 and older should not be on staff. 75 and older should not be on staff. And I don't think women should be on staff at all. Amen. So what should we be? Lifestyle. Lifestyle. How do you get off of staff? That's a problem. <laughs> I feel sorry. You gotta start treating your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Just what's the next thing? What about the use of vitamin supplements? What about what? The use. Vitamin supplements. What, what about vitamin supplements? Like and nutritional supplements. That's a good question. The Cancer Society says don't take them. Because so many of them giving you the wrong results. Remember they thought beta carotene was so good, they gave it to smokers and increased their chance of dying from lung cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Cancer Society said, don't try all these little things so that we're afraid that might happen just like beta carotene. Might not do us any good. Now, some of you people want to know about vitamin B12. I gotta tell you a little bit about vitamin B12. We've learned something new about vitamin B12. Let's see. If I can get this raised. Enough to rice right here. Now, vitamin B12 has to come more of it by now. It has to combine with intrinsic factor which made in the stomach. It combines in the ileum. And you can only absorb so much at one meal. That is her 
hardly worthwhile to get to fortify proofs because they fortify with so little bit. But they've just discovered if you can get a pill, 1% of it is absorbed by passive diffusion. Passive diffusion, they call it. 1% is, is uh, absorbed. So if you take a 500 microgram tablet of vitamin B12, 500 micrograms, then five micrograms would be absorbed. That's plenty. No problem. Much safer to get your B12 that way. Now, who needs B12? Vegan, people don't need any milk or eggs. But also all older people, even if they're meaties, they may need more vitamin B12. Okay? Now, pregnant women must have it orally for the baby to get any of it at all. Every day, you must have it orally. So for pregnant women, it's very important. I had a black girl once. I said, are you tired? Communist symptom for B12 division. No, I'm not tired. But she got away from home once, where they were total vegetarian. And she got to, to Michigan, EMC and ate an egg. It tasted so good, she ate 10 of them at one time. <laughs> and so, I said, are you tired? No, I'm not tired. I gave her the pills orally to make sure they were still absorbed orally. And they were. A few months later, she said, I now know why you asked if I was tired. I thought everybody, when they finished the day's work, would feel like I did. She was tired, but didn't know it was called tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, B12 is a problem for older people, for total vegetarians. You gotta get enough. Now, a person who's a vegan has 37% greater risk of bone fractures because of the calcium. According to the epic Oxford study, I don't believe the study, but anyway. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about this calcium business. So, you have 37% more fractures if you're vegan, don't have any milk. Diet. But if you will get 525 milligrams of calcium a day, you have no increase in fracture risk. So if you don't use any milk at all, how much calcium would you get? The Polish have two different groups which have done studies there, and they say without any calcium in your diet, you will get probably 250 milligrams of calcium a day. One added cup of milk will give you 300 more. And most all artificial milks are now fortified with calcium, same amount. So one cup of artificial milk gives you another 300 milligrams. That's 550 milligrams. Now you're above this deficit level, okay? Another thing you need to know about the calcium if you take your salt intake and cut it in half, you will absorb more calcium. You won't, you'll reabsorb more. You won't excrete so much calcium. It's like taking 900 milligram capsule of calcium every day. If you cut your salt intake in half, just because of the action Second thing you've got to know, vitamin D controls the absorption of calcium. If you have adequate vitamin D in your blood, you will absorb two or three times more calcium. How many of you know what your blood D level is? Anybody? A few of you. 
it's a good thing to know. If you aren't getting enough, get enough, because this helps you with your calcium. The third thing you need to know, all of these foods that have oxalate in them or phytic acid in them, oxalic acid or phytic acid, form an insoluble salt with calcium. Calcium phytate, calcium oxalate, spinach. Calcium and spinach won't count because you can't, can't absorb it. It's tied up with this inside of a salt. See? So you start changing your greens. You go to Chinese greens, bok choy. <laughs> the bok choy doesn't have the oxalic acid. It's good. Okay? So there's three principles, natural way to get your calcium. Now, millions of Americans are taking calcium pills, pills to avoid osteoporosis. With women, we think it may increase their heart attack rate. With men, we know it increases prostate cancer rate. If you use milk, I say you men don't ever get more than one cup of milk a day because it increases the the calcium in there increases your prostate cancer risk. Okay. Yeah. What's that? What about the soy milk? You know, soy milk has some oxalate in it too, but it doesn't have much. And, and I'll tell you, the calcium in soy milk is well absorbed. You should know that. And you should know that men who use more than one half or so cups of soy milk a day have about a 70% reduction in prostate This lady had lost four babies. She was now pregnant again, thought she was going to lose this one because she was anemic. She needed iron. What was I to tell her to do? Stop all that drinking of that English tea. <laughs> Every cup of English tea decreased the absorption of calcium 60%. A cup of coffee decreases it 50%. A cup of milk, because of the calcium, decreases at 50%. A, a food that's high in vitamin C increases the calcium, uh, the iron absorption 100%. So there's a few things we can tell people simply, like this, what to do with certain situations. Seventy's pretty good. Yeah, but how low can you go before? Then you should know whether it's nanograms or millimoles. It's nanograms. So, uh, so I, I wouldn't. I'd get plenty of sunshine. Get all you can get. Eli said she wants to get all the sunshine she can possibly get. Get enough, but don't get sunshine. <laughs> get sunshine, but not sunshine. That's the idea. Keep. Good questions. Any more good questions? What about calcium in greens? Calcium in greens? Yes. How that, much calcium? How much oxalic acid or phytic acid are in those greens? Spinach, lots of oxalic acid. Forget it. The calcium isn't absorbed. Okay. How about yeah. colors and kale? Uh, yes. 
I can give you a list of some of the foods that are better. The, uh -huh. How about uh, moringa? But, but it's the U.S. cabbage that isn't so good. You need to switch. Now, I didn't get through with this chart. I want to go back to this chart here. What does the yellow line represent? Monounsaturated fatty acid. That's a leg. That's, that's a good fatty acid. At first, we used to think it did increase blood cholesterol or decrease. Now we know it decreases. Folate acid. That's a good one. Avocado we're talking about. That's good. What's the blue and the green lines represent? Those are essential fatty acids. You have to have those to live. That's why they call them essential. You have to have them to live. And your body can't make them. You gotta get it in your diet. The blue one is linoleic acid. Okay. That's a good fatty acid, linoleic. So good you lower blood cholesterol. The Heart Association said you can get 10% of your calories from linoleic acid. But that's easily had. The green one's harder to find. There's one food that has a lot of it. What is it? And there's a little seed. What yeah. seed? What's it called? Chia. Chia seed has it too. Okay. So you should know about those two. Now, I can tell you something good about each of these fats. For example, corn oil is a good fat. Corn oil, because it has lots of plant sterols. Stigmasterol, beta cytosterol. These compete with animal cholesterol for absorption. More plants there are also less cholesterol to absorb. Now if I take monkeys to try to produce atherosclerosis on the monkeys, I can't do it with pure cholesterol like the body makes. I've got to have oxidized cholesterol. It's been exposed to the air. That oxidized stuff doesn't do it. So pure cholesterol like the body makes doesn't do that. Any other questions now, Bob? Um, I'm just wondering, is there uh, like a diet which you can get the fat, like all the good foods you can eat? Is there a diet which you can get that tells you all the good foods you can eat? Councils on diet food. Yeah. <laughs> Vegetarian diet is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. You found out it wasn't so good. Okay. Uh, I don't know where you get this at home one day. Come and listen to me once a week. <laughs> but I'm really excited that the medical students said, don't use all those drugs. I thought that's what I've been taught to do. And now the doctors with their statins, they've been taught that everybody should take these statins. Now what are they going to do? Tell them we made a mistake? <laughs> are they have to do that? No. It's hard to sell the doctors on this business that we don't need all those pills. We need lifestyle. It's hard to get them to change. Question back here. Yeah, I noticed that we met, uh, coconut oil is very high in saturated fat, but Coconut oil is different from coconut milk, where you, you get the fresh... The fat is in the milk, and in the oil. Because in the coconut oil, you boil it for a long time before you make the coconut oil. But the, the fresh coconut milk, which is It's high. still a problem, still a problem. Oh. It's still a problem. The, uh, the coconut water is different. Mid-chain triglycerides in coconut milk, high. Yeah. Good for the brain, they said. Right it's not good for the brain. <laughs> That's if you have an epileptic attack. Uh, because in the Philippines, we use a lot of coconut milk, and it's very good. No, don't worry about where the coconut milk is. Can't say it so you drink water when you're seeing it. Coconut milk. Question here. What about almond milk? Almond milk is a 
all the nut butters are good. You see, the peanut butter, that's the highest on the next on the list. Chinese like to cook with peanut oil. It's okay. From there on up, it's all right. All the nut butters are good except for coconut butter. But I'll tell you, the new one on the market, you should get at Costco. It comes from South Africa. Macadamia nut butter. It's the most delicious butter I've ever tasted in my life. Macadamia nut butter. It's healthy. It's healthy. a thirst for drink that we'll want to drink alcohol. So Dr. Register wanted to see if that was true. Head of our nutrition department, Loma Linda. And he took rats, offered them water and alcohol. 12 week study. This is the percent of, of, uh, of alcohol that he offered. On a good diet, no vegetables, every rat knows to drink it. Every rat, rat knows you shouldn't drink alcohol. Humans haven't learned that. But every, every rat knows it. <laughs> aren't supposed to drink alcohol. Okay? So, Dr. Register got junk food diet. Uh, diet. Donuts, junk stuff. Put it together, lots of coffee, spices. Put it together, dried it out, blended it, dried it out, fed it to the rats. And right away, they start drinking some alcohol. And the seventh week, they took off and became real alcoholic rats. Wow. Put them on a good diet, they drink water. Wow. No alcohol. But if you add more spices and coffee to this junk food diet, they became alcoholics immediately. When they paired them and mated them, the rats of these, formerly alcoholic rats, tend to like alcohol. What's going on? We know what's going on. We know phenylalanine in the diet is a central amino acid. Phenylalanine. And we know that can go to make tyrosine, another amino acid. Tyrosine. And that goes to make dopamine. Dopamine. And this goes to make uh, something that's in the poppy plant. It's in the poppy plant. And when you radioactive tag this thing with carbon 14, 50% of the carbon-14 appeared in the urine as morphine or codeine. In other words, junk food diet could make you alcoholic because making alcohol, alcohol blocks a reaction here that makes you go this direction, makes more morphine too. So on a junk food diet, you can create such a thirst for alcohol that you want to drink alcohol that increases the risk of making more morphine in your body. So our bodies can make morphine that isn't good for us. I was down in Miami, the world, the U.S. capital for drugs. They're selling it right on daylight, street. 
They have a lot of rehab centers there. I went into the rehab centers and said, what are you feeding these people? They're giving them a lot of coffee. These alcoholic rats, when they were given more coffee, they became alcoholics immediately. That's what happened. That's what coffee is. Not good for them. Any other questions? Yes. Acidity and alkalinity of the body <coughs> and yes. What part of the body is acid? What part are you talking about? No, you don't know. <laughs> Most people don't know. The body, the stomach has to be acid. The intestines has to be alkaline. The blood better be the same or you're dead. You have three methods to keep the neutralized. That's homeostasis, we call it. Uh, so, don't worry about that. Your body takes care of it by excreting the excess to the kidney. Or breathing differently. You have methods to take care of that. So don't worry about it with this acid around the Yeah. You don't worry about it. Acid and alcohol doesn't matter. The body takes care of it. This is just a starter, just a starter on things you need to know. Simple little things. Um, yes. So when you say the greens, that's all that on solid acid. What's that? When the greens are, you saying spinach has so much on yes. solid acid. Does lemon juice help when you put, you put some lemon juice on it? No, that won't help. It won't help. Okay. Uh, anyway. This is a starter for what you, your lesson number one. This is a starter for what you need to know. Simple little thing that lifestyle is number one in importance. We don't know how to get people to live a life lifestyle. How do you do that? We don't know. That's going to be the next big major breakthrough in health. Learning how to get people to live like they already live. Right now, we don't yet know. Yes. They have a study about soy milk with a person of the almost a million, which is just a bit inaccurate. What's that? I didn't know. Soy milk. Is that good? Is it bad for women? Does it is, is soy milk bad for women? Not true. No. no. They used to think yes. because of the hormone, it's it might increase breast cancer risk. So they went to Asia, took all the Asian women, Chinese and Japanese, <coughs> and took all those, they had operation on one breast removed because of breast cancer, and checked to see who had it returned in the second breast. The ones who ate the most of them had the least return. <laughs> Good. Since that time, they haven't worried. Thanks everybody for coming today. You. See you again next time. Because there is something that has a beauty value that we need to partake of, and that's music. Yeah. So we'll give the time to the men. Yes, while we are doing this for me.